7 a.m. I'm out here treating the bees with oxalic acid while you're probably sitting there drinking coffee. Doesn't seem fair, folks. Hello, folks. Jason Cressman, JC's Bees. I'm out here treating the bees, trying to get them healthy so they can go in the fall and, and not have a high mite count. I'm using my Lurabi uh, vaporizer. Boy, this thing is just handy, and it's super, super quick. I'm looking at about 45 seconds per colony, and I can move on. I absolutely love this thing. Um, cannot stress that enough how nice of a device this is. You can see how quick it's heating up there. 397, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.9, 398. So at this point, the heating element has kicked off. Vaporization is pretty much done. So it's time to change the cap and move on to the next colony. Today I want to talk a little bit about hive setup going into winter for you new beekeepers. I know there's a lot of speculation out there. There's a lot of videos that say you need to do it this way. I want to give you some options. So stay tuned. So finally, the sun is up. The bees are starting to fly. It's going to be a good day for the bees. Hello folks, Jason Christman, JC's Bees, your Central Ohio beekeeper. In today's video, I want to give a couple demonstrations on what a hive should look like going into winter. Now we're going to use empty boxes, but I want to basically just give the setup, the mindset that you should have um, preparing your bees. And we need to start, well, a couple weeks ago, <laughs> to be honest with you. Many beekeepers just pulled all their uh, summer honey, and now the food stores have dropped a little bit. So it's very crucial that right now, right now folks, you're feeding. You should be feeding your bees. And until we get a, uh, our first frost, what I recommend is a one-to-one -one sugar mixture. Now, once we get our first frost, I'll switch to a two-to-one, and that'll be two parts sugar to one part water. And personally, I like to do that by weight and not by volume. You'll get a little bit better reading, and the bees will appreciate that. Another thing we should be thinking of is varroa mites. It's very, very crucial that right now we are treating, if you already haven't in the last couple weeks, um, we want to drop the mite load that our bees have. That way that the next batch of brood that emerges is healthy bees. And them healthy bees are what will overwinter. Did you know that the winter bees are the bees that live the longest? Typically in the spring and summertime, bees live about six weeks. But the winter bees, they live three, four, five months. I know what you're thinking. Why is that? The reason for that is, is in the winter time, the bee's metabolism slows down so much that they're able to live a little bit longer. So we want to make sure we have healthy bees going into winter. And the only way to do that is to be treating right now. Not in two weeks, not in a month, not in six weeks, not in December, right now. If you wait six weeks or to December, you might as well just go ahead and figure you're going to have to order new bees because they're probably going to get sick and die over the winter. And that's because without dropping the mite load, your bees have viruses and infections. They're just sick. Now, how would you like to be sick and go out and clear your driveway? You probably wouldn't. You would look at the snow on your driveway and be like, well, not leaving today. Nobody's coming in here today. So think of it that way. You would want to be healthy. Go out there and clean your driveway and get her done. And that's what we need to have that same mindset for our bees. We need to get them healthy so they can get her done. So what I have here is a 10 frame colony that I want to kind of give you a rough idea what your hive should be looking like as far as equipment and the stuff, the setup going into winter. Starting at the top, you can see we've got a, a nice outer cover. Before I remove the outer cover, there's something very important here I want to show you. You see that entrance right here? You see how I left it revealed? That's so that the warm air has a place to escape this winter. As that the heat rises off the bees, it's going to need a place to get out. So that hole is going to be very crucial. And I know um, there's a lot of you saying upper ventilation is not needed. That upper ventilation is what's kept me from having to buy bees every year because it keeps them alive. So if you've got a way that works for you without a top vent hole, hey, that's great, good for you. But this hole right here has done wonders for keeping my bees alive 
and I can't see any reason to get rid of it. A lot of people argue you're letting a lot of heat escape. Bees don't need heat. Bees are able to thrive in the cold weather. They've been doing it a long time before beekeepers came along. So I have no problem allowing a little bit of heat to go out as long as there's no moisture dripping back on my bees. Okay, so let's go ahead and remove the outer cover. And the next thing you're gonna notice is right here on top, I have a rock. And the only reason I have this rock here is because when the outer cover is on, um, without this, it blocks this off. It drops down the lid down to here. So by putting this at the front, it lifts it up above that hole and bees are able to use it as an entrance and moisture can escape. So we'll set the rock off to the side. Very important, you have a rock, folks. If you've got beehives and don't have rocks, you're not a beekeeper. Next, we have one of my insulated covers that I just shared in a recent video, um, the dimensions, if you wanna make these. Um, these work very, very well. So that is the insulated cover. I'll link that video up in the right-hand corner if you would like to learn a little bit more about these. Okay, so now we get down into the actual brood boxes. You can see I've got all 10 frames in here. They're all pushed tight together. There's no extra spaces. Well, maybe there is, Jason, you liar. Push them all tight together, folks. If there's a big gap in between these frames, what you're gonna allow the bees to do is to draw either burr comb or bridge comb, as I call it. And bridge comb is where they connected a comb from this frame over to this frame. It's rather annoying to deal with. So keep your frames tight together, and it's also gonna make it easier for the bees when it's cold to move from one frame over to the next frame. So I mentioned, um, a lot of you have just removed your surplus honey and you need to feed. Um, what I suggest you do, um, go around to the back of your colony. Take one hand, put right down here, and just lift. And get used to doing that. Do it every day. You don't have to lift it very high, just an inch, and feel how much weight's there. And that's gonna give you an idea of how much food they have. And keep feeding, and keep feeding, until you make an inspection and you notice most of your frames are capped or have uh, syrup or nectar in them. Um, once you reach that point and your colony is good and heavy, here in Ohio I like to uh, see a setup just like this, two double deeps, right around 100 pounds. So, let's think about this. I just told you you need to treat for mites if you haven't. You also need to be feeding your bees. And uh, like I said, you need to get them up to about 100 pounds if, if you're close to Ohio, uh, if you're in a cold region. Um, some places are, are even more than that. So check it with your uh, local beekeeping group, um, a local bee club or something, and try to get some information on what they go into winter as far as hive weight as. So, the bottom box is going to be about the same setup. It's going to be 10 frames. Just like you see there. Now, let's say for instance, you're feeding. So, you have removed a couple frames from your box. And in your box, you have one of these. A division board feeder, or a frame feeder. Let's say you have this sitting up top here. Let's pretend I didn't take out two frames. Let's pretend that that space isn't there. Um, is it okay to go into winter with the feeder still in the colony? I've done it many times. Um, one thing you want to, to uh, watch for is if you're feeding one to one and all of a sudden it gets cold, we get frost, um, you're gonna wanna remove this. The reason I say that is, is that extra moisture in the colony could start to evaporate. And when it does, it's going to condense on whatever it hits above it. And what is above that? This inner cover. So this inner cover is gonna collect the moisture right here 
which could possibly drip back on the bees. Now, that upper, upper vent hole right here will help that moisture escape. But one other thing you can do is elevate your hive slightly at the back so that it's leaning towards the front. And what that's gonna do, any moisture that catches on this inner cover when it's tilted forward like this is gonna to run to this front. And then when it drips, it's just gonna run down the front wall of the hive versus dripping right in the middle, right down onto the bees. So make sure you tilt your hives forward. And that's gonna do another thing for you. Any moisture, snow, rain that lands here on this landing board is gonna run this way versus just sitting here or running back into the colony. So there's two advantages to tilting your, your uh, colonies. So what I like to do, starts to get cold, is I like to remove this. Now I know a lot of people are saying, but it's 40 degrees. I don't know that I wanna get in there. I don't wanna hurt them. Well, if it's 40 degrees, it won't be that temperature for long and it'll get colder. And then by that point, you don't have no option. So go ahead on a 40 degree day, whatever it may be, get that out of there. Then what I suggest you do, I use these shims and these shims here are for nukes, these ones. That's what they look like. You can see they've got the notch in the front to use as a, uh, an entrance or for moisture to escape. And these ones here are for 10 frame colonies. Now what I'll do is starting to get cold. We're in December, we're seeing 30 degree weather. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, put on my mountain camp method. And the mountain camp method, you're gonna need a shim, and this is basically just furring strips, the same size as the box with an entrance on the front. Now I'm gonna take and lay a piece of newspaper in here. I'm gonna jab a few holes in it, and I'm gonna pour in a full five pounds of dry sugar. Trying to spread it out, covering this whole top as much as I can. Now what that's gonna do, any moisture that comes up off the bees is gonna collect in that newspaper and in that sugar. And over a period of time, that sugar is gonna get rock hard. But at the same time, when the bees run out of food, they've now got this emergency up here that they can move up to eat. Yes, dry sugar, the bees will eat it. It won't be dry for long, because the moisture coming off the bees is going to absorb in that. So this mountain camp method offers two things. It offers a place for the moisture to be absorbed, and it also acts as an emergency feed for the bees. So if you were gonna put on this shim, you wouldn't so much need this entrance pointing down. You can now point that entrance up because you've got your moisture escape right here. So now in this scenario, we've got our double deeps, we've got our feeding chim, and we've got our insulated cover. Now, if you don't have the, the money or, or the tools to make your own insulated covers, what you can do is go buy a sheet of uh, styrofoam uh, insulation from Lowe's. Uh, I believe it's three quarters to an inch thick. I can't remember, I'm thinking it's three quarters of an inch thick. Anyway, just get you a piece of that foam and lay it up here in place of the inner cover. And what that's gonna do, it's gonna help hold the heat down in for the bees. Um, pretend you got snow up here on top of this cover. Probably don't, might not even need our rock anymore, damn it. We're not beekeepers now, we don't need our rock. Is now when the inner cover's on, it doesn't drop down far enough to block that hole. And it'll look something just like that. Now at this point, the next thing you need to be thinking of is heavy winds. Um, maybe a wind block, something behind your colony to keep the majority of the wind off the bees. Um, a lot of people resort to using hay or straw, and that's fine if you do that. Just don't put it right against your hives because what I found is hay and straw also attracts mice and other rodents that will and can destroy a beehive in a matter of days. So that brings me to mouse guards 
and I don't have any right here to show you kind of slipped my mind but what I will do is down here over top of this entrance which I have reduced um, I will staple over a piece of rabbit wire right over top of that hole and the rabbit wire is quarter by quarter inch square holes the bees have no problems going in and out it doesn't knock the pollen off their legs um, it works rather well so I'll staple it I'll staple it here and I'll staple it down here what it does do is it stops mice from getting in a mouse gets in there even at this little entrance you think well a mouse ain't gonna fit in that yeah you give a mouse one day to sit here and chew at that wood it will get in there I promise you and when it does it will destroy the inside of your colony and that's because in the winter comb or beeswax is very brittle and the first thing that mouse is going to do is hop up in between two frames and start building the nest and I've seen him start building a nest say over here and it eats through three or four frames and now you've got a big hole going through your combs all the way across the bottom of your box you don't want that folks so get something on there to keep the mice from moving in um, up here probably not a bad idea to staple something here now I wouldn't staple it to the point that you can't lift this maybe staple it to the box and just let it overhang uh, the feeding chimp don't actually staple it to the feeding chimp. That way, if you need to remove this, the feeding chimp for some reason, you're able to do so. So, I think the next thing you're going to do is consider maybe buying some winch straps. Um, depending on your hive stand setup, what I will do is I'll run it from this pipe, I'll wrap it around, and I'll go at an angle and go to that back pipe over there, and I'll strap them down just so the winds ain't toppling them over. Um, come fall and winter So you got to think about your wind block your winch straps your mouse guards feeding mite treatments uh, Insulated uh, inner covers. There's a lot to think about folks now this same setup here is basically what I would use for a 5 over 5 nuke we come down here and look at Stan and Sue, for instance. Now these top boxes, the gray ones, on both of them, both have a feeding jar in it. They are empty boxes. So these boxes will be coming off as I get them fed and get them up to weight. And then the top cover will move down on top of the feeding shims, which I already showed you. Lady, grab a feeding, ladybug, grab a feeding shim. Grab one, honey. Bring it over here. Where's the feeding shim? Ladybug. You're supposed to be helping. They said you were the brains. Everybody says you're the brains of the operation. Where's the feeding shim? Oh, ladybug. I got it, ladybug. Jeez. So this gray box will come off. Um, below the gray box, you can see there's an inner cover. And that's basically to keep the bees from going up into the empty box. This feeding shim will go where the inner cover is. And then I'll use a piece of the foam insulation on top of here. I don't have insulated outer or inner covers for my nukes. I will use just a sheet of the foam insulation on top of here and then my outer cover. Down at the bottom, I've already got the entrance reduced just because I think um, having all the bees guard that tight entrance makes it a lot easier for them to keep small hive beetles out. So now all I have to do is staple over that entrance a piece of rabbit wire and keep feeding. Um, as you've seen at the beginning of this video, I'm working on mite treatments right now. And since I am using oxalic acid, um, and there is still a little bit of brood in here. I'm treating every four days and I'm going to do it for at least a month. Um, oxalic acid works better when they are broodless, but it is definitely possible to drop the mite load when they have brood. But you have to do it, like I said, every four days um, for a course of a few weeks. Now, there's actually a little speculation. Um, some people say, anywhere from four to seven days apart. Um, I think the four day 
um, period uh, creates a little bit better of a mite drop. There's part of my small hive beetle control team. Chicken eating underneath the hives. What do you find, honey? You see anything down there good? Yeah, she found something. I don't know what the heck it was. She found it. So, on a nuke like this, I would like to see it weigh 50, 60 pounds going into winter. Um, so that gives me a lot of feeding between now and then. Um, and just the same with these nukes. You gotta get in the habit, folks, going around the back, giving it a little lifty and see how it feels. Now, just for the heck of it, I did flip this over this morning when I did mite treatments. There's a mite. One mite. But it's only been about an hour and a half ago that I treated, so I'll check back later. But anyway, I just thought I'd check that real quick while we were here. See what that was looking like. Let's check it on stand. I'm not sure I flipped this one over. So there you go, folks. I hope this has been helpful. Um, if there's anything I overlooked or maybe stepped around, um, feel free to ask down below and I'll do the best to answer um, your questions. And if I don't know the answer, surely one of my followers do. I've got uh, some pretty knowledgeable followers that's been doing this for a long time. So feel free to leave your questions down below. Um, if you have an alternative method and you wanna share it, feel free to do that. Also, if you enjoyed this video and it was helpful, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And uh, if you haven't subscribed, please take a second and do that and make sure you click on that little bell so you get notified when I release new videos. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week, folks, on JC's Bees. Oh, wait, I know what you want to know. I know, there's a lot of people been asking. Hey, how's them feral bees doing in the tree? Did they leave? Are they still there? Let's go look. So, the bees in the tree, are they still there? Matter of fact, they are. They landed on that tree limb, it was August 10th. Way over a month now, they've been there. And several storms have passed through. A couple of those storms dropped a couple decent chunks uh, or pieces of uh, honeycomb. So they've obviously decided to, uh, to live on the limb. They're drawing comb. Um, in that comb, I didn't notice any brood. Um, it was all nectar and pollen, so I have to assume that they're raising brood, but at the same time, the cluster is definitely getting smaller than what it was when they first landed up there. So you can see they're directly above the power wire. That's going to the house. That's the reason I haven't messed with them. Um, but it's getting cooler. Um, we've had mornings in the low 50s. The dew in the morning is extreme. I mean, when I go to the farm to move my cows, uh, my pants are soaked up to my knees when I get home because it, it, it's like it rained. There's that much dew. So you, you know they're getting soaked. Sooner or later, they're going to have to make up the, their minds and decide, well, we need to leave here or we're just going to die right here. One of the two. Which is it going to be? So I'm waiting for them to make their move. That's where things lie now. Crazy bees. Good morning, wee bug. Good morning, honeys. Is there a ray go outside? Is the day started? Huh? Wee bug. Let's walk the sleepies. Are you sleepy, girl? Oh, hey, bug, you can wake up. They're waking up. Hey, bug, you have to open your eyes and wake up, girl. Hey, bug, is, it, is you in there, way bug? Way bug, where, where is you? Where way bug at? Oh, way bug, that's going back to bed, girl. Oh, 
the poor baby. Everybody. Let's go outside. Let's go outside.